Welcome back to week three of Drama Online with Miss Farrell. I actually thought this was week four for quite a while, but this is week three. Welcome. Welcome back. So, we are going to be looking back at what we did last week a little bit and moving forward into our first aspect, our first official aspect of dramaturgy. Um, we are going to be focusing on the use of language um, in the play, the ping pong. So we are going to look at what looking at language can do for us, what it can tell us about the play, how we can analyze it, and how that can help us to better understand exactly what is happening. So of course, language is one of the foundations of communication and that is not just in verbal communication because we have things like body language, which has to do with your physical, what, how you communicate with people without even seeing anything. Sign language is another type of language. So language being um, different foundations for how we st not speak, but how we communicate with one another. So before we get into that, just some housekeeping announcements for the Form 3s. First of all, please check up on your friends and classmates. I mean, by that I mean in terms of drama. I mean, of course, you could check up on them and, and find out if they're doing well and how quarantine is treating them and all that. That is fine. But for my purposes, I just want to um everybody to make an effort to speak to their friends, speak to their classmates, the people who you know are supposed to be in theater, and find out if they are getting the work. I have almost all of my students who I should have on Edmodo, but I don't have everybody. I'm missing a few people still. Um, and the only way that I can reach out to them is through you because some of the emails did not send, unfortunately. Um, so yes, just please ask a little question. Say, um, hey, you in drama? Did you get the work that Ms. Farrell sent? And if they... Um, completely unaware of what you're talking about please um put them on to me or put me on to them and i will make sure that they get on board with what we've been doing for the last three weeks um yes so that is what i mean when i say check up on your friends and classmates i just want to make sure that everybody is getting any work i know we have some people who don't have devices or they don't have internet or whatever the case might be um but if you do encounter somebody who is not getting the work, just put them on to me. Right. Don't forget to read the play, the ping pong. As I said, it is in the class folder on um, Edmodo. I said that you had two weeks to read it. One week is gone and now you have another week to read it. As I said, it's very easy to read, I would like to think. And it is very short. It's only 10 pages long, so it shouldn't take you long. I know some people have read it already, which is very commendable. Um, I could see that in the homework from last week, so that is great. Um, and of course, I would encourage you to read it again so that you understand it even better if you have read it already. And the third thing um, on our housekeeping for today, I think some people have learned this the hard way, but... Quizzes are time sensitive, meaning that you have a certain amount of time to complete them. So when you are ready to do a quiz, just make sure that you're not moving in between houses. Make sure you sit down right by the Wi-Fi. Um, was the word box? No, that's not the word. What? Um, hmm. I forgot the word right by the wi-fi <laughs> so that you have a strong signal so that nothing is going to interrupt you um because they most of the quizzes have a time limit so you actually have to sit down and and complete it then and there you can't go and come back to it otherwise it will disappear but of course if something does happen things happen just message me and say miss um i was I had started doing a quiz and somebody called me and whatever the case is and I will just erase the submission so that you can try it again. Right, so our homework last week, part of it was to find out facts about Errol Hill, Dr. Errol Hill. So he's not a medical, well he was not a medical doctor but he was basically a doctor in theatre. Um, and you 
all did some really great research. I had some great efforts coming out of this class. So I'm very proud of you all. Um, and all of the facts that I'm going to put here today are things that you found, things that I pulled out from your fact sheets. So if you don't see something that you found here, that's fine. It just means that it wasn't as pertinent as the other ones, which is absolutely fine. But you all did great work. So what did we learn about Uncle Errol? We learned that he was a Trinidadian. He was from Port of Spain. He was born in 1921. So that means that in 2020, he would have been turning 99 years old. Um, he died in 2003. But that's just to give you an idea of how old he would have been. Um, actually, he was born before steel pan was invented because steel pan was invented in the 1930s. Um, he was a leading voice for the development of theater in the West Indies. He was one of the main people in across the islands um, who was really pushing for theater to become recognized and to become instituted in the Caribbean. And he was one of the founding members of the Whitehall Players, which is a group in, well, was a group in Trinidad and Tobago that, um, really gave room gave a platform for some of the for a lot of people who are the best actors and performers and playwrights in Trinidad and Tobago so of course players come in from the word play um long ago they used to call actors players um because they would play a character in a play so the Whitehall players was a group of actors more or less um that Dr. Errol Hill had founded he was one of the leading voices there um and remember when we were looking at the roles of people in a production we said that a lot of times there are four people covering one role and this is just an example he was a playwright an actor a director a historian slash scholar and a teacher well, a professor, educator, whatever word you want to use. But you see how many different things he did. So sometimes he would have directed his own plays. So in that instance, he would have been the playwright and the director and the producer probably and so on and so on and so on. Um, so he taught at UWE in Jamaica and he also taught at UWE in, right here in St. Augustine. He also taught in Nigeria and in the USA. And he won a Hummingbird Gold Prize for Drama. I would have hoped that in primary school you studied um, the awards, the national awards, and the Hummingbird Gold. It's a very important national award, so he was um, he was rewarded. Um, he was awarded, sorry, for his great work in drama, and he also studied at RADA, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, which is a school in London, and it is one of the top three. Um, drama schools in the entire world so ju this just goes to say um, how great of a man he was because he was literally um, on that program and we have a few Trinidadians who have been on that program since in London right so what did we find about the ping pong itself it was written in 1950 which would have been 70 years ago actually for homework you were going to find out when it was set because a play is not necessary, it might be, but it's not necessarily set in the time that it was written. It's a play in one act, which is why it's so short, only 10 pages long. And it's a backyard com comedy drama. So whatever that means to you, that is what it is. Um, so it's, as we mentioned, is set in the early days of gang rivalry among steel bands. You are going to find out when that was. And he said that it was written to let people understand what was in the minds and hearts of those steel band players who would have been the players that um, were involved in these riots um, and barricades and things like that. Um, because they had different steel bands that used to compete with each other, not just in Pan, but in real life as well. And this is written in the Trinidadian vernacular, that scary V word. Some of you may know it, some of you may not know it, but we are going to get into that um, a little bit, well, quite a bit more in this class as we move on today. Fantastic. So we are looking at language. Now we are into this week. 
this is a short class and that is because the exercise that you have to do is a little bit um, longer than usual um, just because it requires a bit more work so also I would just kind of want to ask you all to really pay attention because I'm going to introduce some kind of complex topics and I I want you all to understand it completely so what I'm going to talk about now these definitions overlap a lot um, what I want you all to understand is that I need you to forget everything that you know for a minute and just let me educate you about these particular things so we are talking about how we call the way we speak what we call things and in our lives there are a lot of words that we use that are not necessarily accurate um, but what I want to teach you is the accurate way to say things just so that when I say when I correct you on things you'll understand what I'm saying so if I say well you were a little bit off to say that he was speaking in slang because slang is not XYZ is the case blah 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 um, so I just want you all to understand these concepts so that you will use the right terms when you're talking about things um, yes yeah, so I just need you to rethink and kind of try to reprogram your brain with what I'm going to tell you um, and these definitions that I'm going to tell you they change sometimes they overlap it's a little bit confusing so don't focus too hard on learning the exact definition but just understanding how the term works <clears throat> so we are just recapping a little bit we did this last term as well we learned that language in a play or language in gen in real life anywhere can tell you a lot of things and by language of course I mean um, the way that people speak can tell you a lot about different things like it can tell you their social status can tell you whether somebody is royalty someone who's royalty or the president would definitely not speak in the same way that a vagrant would speak or that a lower class working class person would speak so um yes pretty straightforward the way you speak can sometimes be an indicator of your social standing so it tells you location and culture more than likely if you have a play with eight characters and all eight of them sound like Trinis more than likely the play is set in Trinidad and Tobago and of course specific language would tell us things about the culture and that would be things about how people interact what they eat um, how they pray all sorts of different things so language will be an indicator of where the play is set and also when the play is set so the ping pong is actually um, as I said in a previous era so the way that they speak then is not necessarily the way that we speak now. There might be a whole lot of similarities, but um, but in a major way is really looking at the slangs and how differently um, people used to talk. For instance, even in, in the 2000s, people speak differently from spoke differently from how they would speak in 2020. So we're also looking at character relationships so the way that people speak to each other can tell you what kind of relationship they have so um, a teacher a student wants to approach a teacher and say hey why you do think 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 whatever the case is because that's not an informal relationship so the way that people speak to each other will tell you what kind of relationship they have more than likely if you're speaking to somebody in the vernacular if you're speaking to your friend you're not going to speak to them the same way that you speak to your teacher so in the same it operates just like that in plays um, you'll find out how characters how familiar they are with or are not with each other from the way that they speak Um, so you'll find out context, subtext, pretext. We've been through this already. Um, and in part of that as well, considering the characters' names is also a part of language. And a lot of times playwrights strategically, like they would specifically pick names to suggest different things. So if you think about 
um, the ping pong as a backyard comedy comedy drama, and you have characters named Butts from Butters, or Midge, who is described as being short, or Iron Man, who is basically a bully. So these names are indicative; they indicate some aspect of the character's personality as well. So that's just something to consider when you're talking about language. Um, and it also frames the context and the subtext of the play. And of course, personalities, values, and attitudes. So you'll get to know which characters are humorous, which characters are cocky, which characters are self-aware, which characters are funny. I said humorous already. but And you'll also find out what they think about certain things. Um, how they feel about certain things, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So, as I introduced briefly earlier, we are going to be looking at spe some specific terms about how you speak about the way that speak people speak. So, talking about language. And there's a nice, big, fancy word for that, for the study of how people speak, for the study of language. And that word is called linguistics. So we are going to do a little bit of linguistics right now. Write that down. Write down linguistics. Great. So, the standard English is what, we are what I am using right now, generally. These slides are written in standard English. Um... And that is because so this is any lang this is any form of English that has specific rules as to how things go. So you'll have subject verb agreements. The basically the English that you learn in English A that is standard English. Um, now, it's not right to say then that standard English is any more correct than how you speak regularly how you would speak outside of a classroom, how you'd speak to your neighbor. It's not any more correct. It just has a different usage. So standard English is just as much of an English as your regular way of speaking is an English. Um, so yes, that's that's my whole point about it. Standard English is literally it's just the, the language that you use for education. So as I said, this slide is um, written in standard English. Um, so for instance, uh, in, in terms of the rules of spelling and things like that, the word sandwich, there's only one way to spell sandwich, and that is because that is the English way of spelling it, and that is the correct way. As opposed to other forms of languages, they might have a particular word and there are different ways to spell it, because it's not in the dictionary and things like that. So it is more or less always the same and it is also formal. But then again, you'll have British Standard English and then you'll have American Standard English, which are not necessarily the same. So if you think about how British people, and we also say bill, um, we'll say a dollar bill. No, I like that's American. Um, but British people will say a note, so they'll say a $5 note instead of a $5 bill. So it's just different forms of the same standard English. So then a dialect. Now it's important to note that it's never just dialect. You don't speak dialect. You will speak a dialect. And that is because a dialect is always something of another thing it is always a subset of another language um so the uh the a here is very important so basically a dialect is as i said um a particular form of whatever language and that particular form would be spoken by people of a particular region so as i said it's a subset of a broader language so for instance in the Caribbean, our vernacular, which we'll learn about in a second, is a dialect of English. The way that we speak, even when we're not speaking standard English, is a dialect of English, meaning that it's its own language 
It's, it's a language by itself, but it stems from another broader language, which in this case would be English. And vernacular is really just ordinary language. Vernacular is just how we speak on a day-to-day -day basis um, in informal situations. So, of course, there are different types of vernaculars, and um, they also indicate your kind of class standing and your education level as well. So, as I was mentioning before, um, and we will go on to learn about how our, our vernacular is a creole and what that really means, um, but refrain from saying that you speak broken English. Because as I said, these are all languages in their own right. So in as much as English is a language, a Trinidadian Creole or a Tr Trinidadian vernacular is another language in itself as well. It has its own structures. It has its own words like dotish and um, polori and things like that. So it's not a matter of saying that you speak a broken language. There's n absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just different uses. You just cannot necessarily use the vernacular if you're going to sit down and write an examination because it's not standardized, if you understand what I'm saying. There's not one particular set of rules to say, okay, you can only spell dotish this way or you can only use this word in that context and those kinds of things. So it's not, it is informal. It is not formal. It is definitely informal language but it's not broken because broken means that something is wrong with it nothing is wrong with it and you should be proud of the way you speak because when you go abroad that is what people love the most they love the way that trinidadians speak um and it is something to be proud of because it's something very unique and it's what makes us who we are and it's what sets us apart so actually that's why sometimes you find it so difficult to speak in standard english or even write because that is so much a part of who we are and how we express ourselves that it's kind of different. It's kind of difficult to express yourself in a different language than you are used to. So straight, refrain from saying that you speak broken English. So then what is a Creole? Because we just said that our vernacular is a Creole. Um, so the, as I said, these definitions change, but the one that I am going to use for these purposes is that a Creole is any language that comes from a mixing of cultures. So, in a sense then, um, our way of speaking, our vernacular, which is a Creole, is made up of words from all different cultures. So if you look at the places that we have in Trinidad, we have San Susi, we have Monrepo, Separia, San Fernando, all these places are from different languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, some of them Amerindian, all kinds of things like that. So in a nutshell, a Creole, which is what we speak on a day-to-day -day basis in, an, in non formal situations, is any language that comes out of mixing different cultures. So as I said, I was as a mix of all sorts of different things, a big Kalu. And a Creole then will be a dialect. So our Creole is a dialect of English because English is of standard English then, because English is our main, is the main component. But of course, as I said, there are words coming from different cultures and things like that as well. So a Creole is a dialect of another language or other languages that mix to become the Creole. So then what is Patois? Now this one is a little bit tricky because Patois sort of means different things in different countries. But a patois is quite similar to a creole. Um, but the only difference when looking in Trinidad specifically is that our patois is French based. So if you think about words like jamet or pomcite, these are not English words. These are words that are not French either. They're not French and they're not English. But they came from that mixing of cultures, mixing of French and English and whatever was um, in the kitchen <laughs> at that particular point in time. Um, so our patois, as I said, is a French. Is it's spoken very rarely, 
not very many people speak Patois fluently in Trinidad and they mostly live in certain places, places like Paramin. Um, there are lots of Patois speakers, but because um, mo most of us, our grand great grandparents or grandparents would have spoken Patois, but what happened is that they used to use it so that the children at the time would not understand what they were saying. Um, so they never passed it on to the children because it was almost a, a, as a way of talking in code. So Patois is kind of a dying language in, in Trinidad, but you won't generally hear somebody speak in Patois just like that. However, in Jamaica, their Patois is their vernacular. So their Patois is their English and the way that they speak on a regular basis. So that's something just to be cautious of. So slang then, slang is not a generalized term for the way that you speak, but slangs are particular words and phrases. And just think about slang being like fashion. So sometimes you have old fashions that come back, sometimes you have completely new fashions, um, but it's just something that is in at that point in time. So um, it would be words nowadays like zest, or you might say slay, or wow, I feel old because I feel like I don't know any of the young slangs. But these particular words and short phrases that are only in style now because people say them. So, a so you cannot talk in slang, but you can use slangs in your language, which is completely normal. Right, I did say that this was going to be a short class. So just moving on. So your homework, as I said, and it is short because I'm giving you more time to complete this exercise. And I'm very excited. Um, I think it's going to be interesting for us if you let it be interesting for you. So first, padang. I need you to find out the significance of the title, the ping pong. So this means to say, why did he name it the ping pong? What is the ping pong? Why? Why would Errol Hill name this play the ping pong? What does it have to do with anything? And these things can be in your own words. This is what I want you to understand. There is no one right answer that you are going to find in Merriam-Webster's dictionary or whatever dictionary for this. So I want you to get just get out of the, the habit for this particular exercise of copying and pasting because a lot of times, there are going to be things that you will not find on the internet, um, especially when you're from Trinidad and Tobago or you're from the Caribbean or any place like this where we don't necessarily control the flow of information and data on the internet. There's a lot of things that will be hard to find or impossible to find. And the way we get around that is that we have such rich um, sources of knowledge in people that are older than us or even sometimes people who are our same age. So your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, aunt, uncle, cousin, teachers, neighbors, all of these things. These are the ways that you find out information because remember we spoke about primary and secondary research and the best way to research is to do both of them. Um, so what I want you to do is, let me go on to the next guide. So you're going to find out when the play is set. I would recommend you find out this from a history teacher. And all you need to know is that it's set when there were gang rivalries between the steel band players in Port of Spain. And then you can go and ask your history teacher and say, Miss or Sir, when did this happen? And they'll be able to tell you when the play was set. All this to say that you should not expect to find everything on the internet and you should also feel free to use your own knowledge. You have so much knowledge in your head and so much sense and so much comprehension. When you read things like this, you can actually come up with your own answers instead of depending on somebody to define it for you. So this is the interesting part. I want you to create a glossary with all the unique and unfamiliar uses of words and phrases in the text. The text is the ping pong. Obviously, you're going to need to read the play. 
Um, so I have provided a worksheet. On the worksheet, there are some, there are certain phrases and words that I, I specifically want you to do. But, and if you don't get all of them, that's absolutely fine. Um, however, um, there sh should also be words that you are not familiar with and any, when you're going through the play, anything else that you look at and you're like, hmm, I don't quite know what that means, you should also add it to the glossary. So the glossary is not limit to, limited to what I put there, but there should also be um, things that you go through and you say, ah, I'm not too sure what this means. So, listen carefully when I say that this homework is not necessarily a Wikipedia copy and paste homework. I want you to ask your teachers. There are certain things that you'll be able to ask your music teacher or ask your history teacher. I want you to ask your parents. I want you to ask your friends. If you're on social media, I want you to put out a poll and ask a question and say, say does anybody know about this? Does anybody know about that? Of course, there are certain things you can Google as well. But as I said, um, it's not necessarily going to be all of them. And I also want you all to understand that things like this, where we go on the internet and see that we can't see that many things about ourselves, but we can see a whole lot of things about things from other cultures. These are things that we can change and these are things that we should hope to change and want to see more of ourselves available for every for the whole world to see on the internet. But I digress. <laughs> Back to my point. So this glossary you're going to fill out either through your own understanding by using common sense or you're going to fill it out. I And a lot of these things, because it, they, it's a play written in a different era, a lot of these things are things that you would not necessarily understand, but somebody older than you would be like, oh yes, I remember when we used to say X, Y, Z. This means blah, 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 blah. So what I want you to do is just, especially as everybody's home, utilize the people you have around you, particularly older people. Also, don't be afraid to get in contact with other teachers and find out from them. As I said, research is always best when you pull from different sources. So pull from as many sources as you can to fill out this glossary and also add words and phrases that you are not familiar with and you pick up on when you are reading the text. The text is a ping pong. <laughs> I've said that already. But that is basically it. Um, as I said, so you might read and say, huh. What's this word, boy? I, I'm not too sure what that means. Let me go and ask my grandmother. Or let me go and ask my mother what she thinks that this means. Um, and so on. So that is what I want you to do this week. As well as a quiz, of course. It's only 10 questions this time around. But who knows? I might get into some mischief. Um, and add more questions. Right. So that's it for today. Of course, you know, this assignment is due before our next session. Um, thank you very much for paying attention. And of course, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Have a happy Wednesday.